Hello. I, I assume everyone can hear me okay. Um, yes. Are we all good? I think we're all good. Welcome to my studio. It currently smells of calamari and Stella Artois because we've been shooting fish and beer this week, which is pretty grim. Um, but yeah, so what we're going to do here is we're going to do a bit of a, a presentation, almost slideshow-esque, just to explain a few bits, looking at hard light and tethering. And then I'm going to show you behind me exactly how to do it, a bit of a, a crash course kind of way. So this is by no means an all singing, all dancing. Here's everything you could ever possibly need to know. This is more of a, this will get you up and running doing this sort of work. And then at the end, we'll do a bit of a Q&A. And yeah, that's the gist of it. It's a bit weird because I can't see any of you guys. So I'm currently talking to a point and shoot camera across the studio and my uh, ragdoll cat's roaming around as well. So slightly bizarre situation. So if we just dive right in, let me just pull up the uh, slideshow. So we've been kind of fortunate in this, in that Wex and BenQ have uh, agreed to sponsor this, uh, which is why you get to have it for free. Um, and both the brands that I use, so BenQ, if you've ever seen around my studio before, I think we currently have about eight BenQ monitors, although I did give away a few recently. Um, and we use them for everything. They are the, the monitor I go for, they're the sort of the, in terms of like image quality, they're what I need for what I do. And we'll talk more about that later. Wex, they're the guys I use when I buy brand new kit. And there's only two places I buy kit from, and that is Wex and eBay. And there's like clearance sales. So a lot of my kit secondhand, but when I buy it new, it comes from Wex because they do next day delivery as well as Amazon do, which is a, a pretty good thing. And also if something goes wrong, it's, it's much easier to deal with. Now, part of the deal of this is that the BenQ monitors are on a special offer over at Wex. So there'll be a link which goes out to that you can click on and sort of get a good, a good deal on this. And this BenQ monitor here is the one that I'm currently using in my office. Um, and I actually have two BenQ monitors in my office, one for video and one for stills editing, um, and then several around and about for various other bits. But we'll talk about that more in a bit. So most of you won't know my work at all, um, which is absolutely fine. I am not a big famous photographer, um, but I work as a commercial photographer and I'm represented by Lisa Pritchard Agency, um, who is, or Lisa is one of the, the top agents in the world for what she does. Um, and she's been around for a duration which she won't disclose to me, but I've seen evidence of 2002, um, her still being very well known at that point. So. She's well known in the game, um, but this is the sort of work I do. So I shoot a lot of very bold and graphic work for ad campaigns for billboards. Um, the biggest campaign we shot recently was the GoPuff one in London, which was literally on every media out of home option there was. Um, and then we did the same in Paris and France. Um, but prior to that, we shot for PepsiCo, uh, Doritos, um, who else we shop for? Lot, lots of food brands, but the, the general gist is that we do this bold and vibrant work. Um, and obviously with the, the paychecks being quite lucrative from this, it affords me to spend a lot of time doing personal work, which is things like this. And this is the sort of work which allows me to get the big commission. So we only shoot a few times a year, but when we shoot, we go big. And in between that, we do things like we did today with beer and calamari and end up with a sticky studio mess. So most of my work is with hard light um, and for various reasons and various stylistic approaches. So the image on the left is like a, a giant uh, full English breakfast, like BAP, cob, depends on where you're from. Um, and obviously the hard light there just allows you to get really crisp detail. If it was soft, it'll kind of blend in a bit. And, you know, the specularity of the light as well, it really helps. The same with the uh, protein bar which actually looked more like a chocolate bar to me, but it was a protein bar we shot. Um, this is actually commercial work as well, but it's got that same crisp, sharp look, which is what I go for. And thankfully, is also what's in trend at the moment. Um, sometimes we slightly diffuse the hard light, which we'll, we'll get to later on, because a lot of people get diffused, soft, hard, and specular confused, but we do tend to diffuse it sometimes to give it a bit more of a more worldly, natural look. But personally, my sort of favorite and go-to is just as hard and crisp as you like to the point where I got contacted this morning by an ad agency in London who thought I was a graphic designer. And that to me was a compliment because although there's a there's a school of photography, which is it should be real, you should capture the moment, the whole Cartier-Bresson kind of thing. 
Uh, for me, the camera is just a tool to create what I want to see, which is why I work out of a studio. Um, so a lot of my work has this sort of fake look to it. Um, and that's by design. It didn't used to. I used to shoot documentary. I actually used to shoot, um, go on tour with bands, go to festivals. I do a lot of documentary work and that sort of thing, but it wasn't for me. Uh, so the sort of comedic effects of food photography as well as something I do a lot of work with. Um, we very recently missed out on a big job, which I'm gutted about, which was all about punchlines in food. Um, so the, the banana shot was part of the treatment we put together for that sort of campaign. Um, I'm a big fan of fast food, children's food, kids' food. Do a lot of work with nostalgia. So this is like all the different fillings you might have had as a kid in the 90s at school in the UK. Um, and then also just trying to display things in new ways. So uh, the image on the left is a personal series I shot, which was all about the uh, we call it like lunchtime meal deals. You know, you go down to Tesco's at lunch from the office and you go and grab your sandwich, your drink, and whatever else it is. We did that from each different thing. Um, that, that's something we, we, like, we, I say we because I work as part of a team um, with me being the photographer and then there will also being assistants, technicians, digital techs, stylists and it's, it's a pretty full, full crew when we're shooting. But hard light is what I keep coming back to and if, if you've ever seen around my studio you'll notice I have every lighting modifier known to, known to man, it's all in here. There is nothing that I, I couldn't do or that I don't have in terms of lighting equipment. Um, but you, as you'll see when we go through how to shoot it, I almost always use no modifier whatsoever. Um, so yeah, this is the sort of work I do. It's always just trying to get that bold graphic style out. And because of that, it kind of lends itself to hard light. And, and this can work in lots of different genres of photography. It can work in portraiture, it can work in um, even architecture photography, there's a lot of people who wait for those clear blue skies where the sun's really high just so they can get those crisp shadows in the buildings. That's part of the architectural design. So it's something which is very much applicable across the board. It is also very conveniently for me something which is absolutely in trend at the moment. So having hard, like crisp shadows, bold graphic work, that's kind of the going thing right now. So for me, it's great because it means I can literally have my pick of clients I want to shoot for. Well, Theoretically, obviously not actually, um, because they all want this style of work at the moment, pretty much. There's the odd few who are still flagging behind a bit, but for the most part, everyone's going for these bold graphic shots where it's just something a little bit different. So I'm going to try to, within the space of the hour of which I've just wasted 10 minutes talking about myself, tell you exactly how to do hard light, what hard light is. We're going to go through the theory of it now in a few slides. Then we're going to go through the practicalities of it and then look at how I tether to the machine as well, because that is a very useful part of shooting hard light. So there are four ish types of light out there. And this is where most flash brands have got you confused. So we have soft light and hard light, which you're probably familiar with. So hard light being when you get those crisp shadows, if you imagine middle of the day, summer, sun's high in the sky, it's tiny and you know you've you've got dark shadows under your eyes, you've got dark shadows on the ground from your, your body, and they're crisp and sharp. That is hard light coming through. And then when a giant cloud comes across it, it turns that tiny pinprick of a sun in the sky into now being the size of the cloud relative to you. Of course, the sun is bigger, but it's further away. So every light source has the possibility to be hard or soft, depending on how far away it is from the subject. Now, the bit which confuses people is specularity and diffusion. So if you look at a softbox, the diffusion is what you get when you have like the white cloth in front of it, and that kind of scatters the light particles out. Specularity is exactly the opposite of that, and that is the kind of tin foil crispness. So if you imagine your standard reflector, it's got that tin foil crispy kind of look to it, that will create specular light. We'll have a look at some modifiers. I'll pick them up and show them to you in a bit to explain it all. But everything is a sliding scale. So it's not just hard or soft, specular or diffuse. There's a whole sliding scale amongst that. So with some of the images, like the toffee apple one I showed you, that had hard diffused light. Some images I showed you had hard specular light, and some of them had soft specular light, which is what would you get if you got a soft box and ripped out all of the baffles on it and just had the foil interior. So it's important to know that and it's 
it, these things are the same across all photography, all cinematography, it's just like a hard, fast rule. And of course, the size should have mentioned the relative size of the item to the relative size of the light source. So if you have an ant and you're photographing an ant and you put a speed light next to it, that is going to be very soft light because it is infinitely bigger than the ant. If you get a person and then put a speed light on the opposite side of the room, that is going to be very hard light because relatively it is small to the subject. So it's important to understand that and realize that all lights have the potential to be all different things. One of the biggest difficulties people have with hard light is the light position. And I say this is probably especially true in portraiture. I used to do a lot of portrait work when I started out. Um, so obviously I went from doing the going on tour with bands and all the rest of it and going, this is rubbish, I'm really skint, to doing celebrity portraits, book covers, editorials for magazines and that sort of thing where you get paid considerably more. And the reason I always shied away from hard light was because it was difficult to get perfectly right. Whereas soft light, you put a big soft light source, I've got a three meter by two meter soft box hitting me from up on the ceiling there. It's pretty hard to mess that up. But if I had a hard light source, the angle has to be perfect. And if you look at the two lights here, the Coca-Cola bottle and the um, hot dog, they were shot with the same light and same modifier, but the position of the light was different. That was the only difference between it. So it's the angle of the light, the height of the light, and the distance of the light. That's what chooses the aesthetic you're going to receive there. Now, this is a very quick crash course in this, of course, but this is a fundamental of all photography. Whether you're a landscape with natural light, you're shooting with window light, it doesn't matter. It is the inverse square law. And as you'll see from my beautifully designed graph here, we have power down the left-hand side, and we have distance on the right hand side. You do not need to understand how the inverse square law works mathematically, that is not important, that is pretty much a, unless you're really techie savvy and a mathematician, not worth knowing. But what you need to know is, we have high power here, which is high power that hits the subject, not in terms of the flash power going up and down, but how much of it's hitting the subject, and distance over here. When the light's really powerful and right up in your face, it's very strong. As you move that light away, you'd assume it disappears evenly, but it does not. It disappears in great chunks. When you go from one foot to two foot away, you lose 75% of the light. When you go from two foot to three foot away, I think you go down from 25% to something like 18%. And then it slowly tails off. And once your light is between seven and nine meters away, the difference in light in that seven to nine meter window is pretty much even. So when you want to do funny shots like this banana one where it's evenly lit with hard light, that is how we cal calculate the distance at which the light needs to be from the subject. Don't worry if you're getting lost at this point when I show you it in reality, it'll make much more sense, but this is just a bit of theory for those who learn better this way. And then modifiers. Modifiers are, one of the best reasons to shoot hard light is because you save a lot of money on modifiers. Um, you really don't need all that much money to be able to achieve good hard light images. You can also save a lot of money on the actual um, lighting you're using anyway because you don't need massive power. You don't need watts and watts and watts of light because you're not putting it through a huge softbox with loads of baffles and all of that sort of thing. Now, the three examples here, we've got the pear, which was shot with this complete bare bulb. Um, and nothing else to create this crisp shadow. And these backgrounds here, they're just sheets of paper. Um, I can probably show you one shortly. The shot in the middle is shot with a soft lighter. And that was specifically designed to photograph architectural buildings in the 1980s. You know, the tiny little models they made out of paper and stuff. They used those modifiers to photograph it because it replicated the most aesthetically pleasing sunlight possible. And then the far right, we used a, a bare bulb from behind, but a scrim at the side of the glass. And we'll talk about that as well as we go through, but there's very little you need in terms of modifiers for hard light, maybe a reflector and a push, a bit of tracing paper. Now camera settings, I'm just gonna turn off the uh, screen recording here so we can show you it a bit better. There we go, is it just me there? I think it's just me there now. Camera settings, as something we're going to look at in shot. So what I've just explained to you there is the world's fastest, quickest, most undetailed explanation of hard light. But I think once you see, oh, you can still see the slides, hang on. 
stop sharing the slides. There we go. Thank you. I've got someone telling me when I'm messing up. Um, so what we're going to do now, I'm going to show you how this works in person. Um, but there's, there's very little to achieving good hard light images, um, but most of it comes down to the finessing of what you're doing. Now, in terms of the camera and the settings and everything else, I'm going to quickly go through the kit because I know I'll have a million and one questions. Um, but I tend to use two different camera setups. One is a Canon 5DSR with a standard lens, which is something like this. Um, and I tend to use a 100 millimeter lens. This is a Carl Zeiss Milvis Macro Planner, which I did coincidentally buy from Wex. Um, I think I bought the cameras from Wex as well. So yes, we use these a lot, but the camera we're going to use today is the actual camera I use for my commercial work, which is this weird monstrosity back here. I'm going to do some minor rejigging of furniture, and then I'm going to go through these slides again, showing you exactly how it works. So, this thing here, this is my camera. This is actually a Mamiya RZ67 front end. This is a Cambo Actors Bellows in the middle, and it's a Canon 5DSR on the end. And the reason is, I think that for hard light to look really good, you need to have a very crisp image. Now, I'm not particularly into pixel peeping and all that sort of stuff, but I do like the image to look crisp at full print size. Um, because if you're going to shoot something which is like hard light, it needs to be crisp. Now, in order to have good hard lights and good shadows, you need both the subject and the shadow to be in focus, um, which is where a camera like this comes in handy. If you don't have this, you can focus stack, uh, which is what I did for years, but this is quicker. The other thing to think of is you want as much detail as possible. If you're shooting hard lights, you're really capturing detail, especially if you're using specular lights. So I'd often be on this lens here at f22 or f16, and for everyone going, what's about chromatic aberrations? And it doesn't matter with these lenses, they're six by seven centimeter image circles. Um, on a Canon lens, I'd probably be f8, f10, somewhere around there, um, or any other 35 millimeter brand. So we've got the 100 ISO for optimal image quality, the aperture which gets us the most detail, and then I've got this weird tilt shift lens going on, which is very useful. So that's the that's the nuts and bolts of the camera and the settings. And this makes my work really simple because I don't ever have to look at an image and go, I wonder what camera settings I should use today. I just go, well, we're shooting hard light with crisp lines and of course I need these settings. So that is already sorted for me. Now, despite the fact I have something daft like 25 lights in here, almost my entire portfolio is shot with one light. And I'm gonna show you that next. That is very important as part of the kit. small crash. There we go. So this is a studio head. It's actually a Broncolor something, Broncolor Pulso, I think. And these are the heads that I use for my work. These are 3,200 watt heads, although I think this particular one is a 1,600 watt. And it has this cool zoom feature, which helps you stop getting double shadows and bits like that. The majority of my portfolio is shot exactly like this. So just flash, no modifier. That is most of my work. And this gives me a crisp, hard light when it's from a distance. Now, sometimes I want to get more detail and I want to get some specularity. And we spoke about this earlier in the different types of light. And for that, I use these here. These are P70 reflectors. Um, and these were also, bizarrely enough, from Wex. Um, and these are bomb proof. If you look at the state of this, I've had this many a moons um, and I've had to hammer it out a few times as well. But you see this crisp interior here, this is what gives you that specularity. It's the exact opposite to diffusion material. So if I wanted to have an extra crispness about it, I might add this modifier or a similar modifier. Um, Bowens used to produce something called a high performance reflector, which is very similar. I don't think Pro, no, Profoto do a Magnum or something like that. Um, but yes, the, these are quite useful. But this is the general gist. It's just one of these, one of these, and we're kind of good to go. And again, that makes life simple. Now, obviously, this is your typical hard light setup. If you're going to go for soft light, you'd probably go for something like this, which is bigger. If you put these two next to each other, this is obviously bigger. It's got the diffusion on it here, which is this like white material across the front, and that will diffuse the light. 
this is hard, and if I put the reflector on it, this is hard and specular. So they're my two kind of extreme options in lighting. So we've got our camera settings all sorted. We know we're going to use a hard light source. So things start to come together quite easily. And this is where having fewer and fewer options allows you to spend more time choosing exactly what it is you want to do with that work. And with this being in trend at the moment, it's great because you can turn up to a shoot with two cameras, two lenses, and just two lights, one for your main light, one for a backup, should you knock it over, which I obviously regularly do. So I've got my light set up back here already. And I've just taken my modifier off it, so you can just see it's a bare bulb light at the back. And the first thing I need to do is get my camera set up in order to take the first frame of the shot. So we're all kind of set and running. And this is pretty much as simple as my job can be, really. So I've got a, a very simple object. So I think it's important to show that you don't need to go and buy something fancy to photograph. Almost anything can look pretty good, really, under the right light. There we go, I'm just focusing the camera, super. Now, we've got the camera settings, we've got the light and the modify and all that chosen. So the important thing now is to work out where to place the light. And this is why people get confused. It's like, well, I know I've got to have a light, that's, that's a given, but where do I place it? How do I know where to put this light over here? Now, if I just quickly pull back up the slide again, because I believe you can see both at the same time, of the inverse square law, We want to be hitting it somewhere around at the bottom bit where the, the lighting levels out because we don't want the top of this bottle opener to be really bright and we don't want the bottom of it to be really dark. So we know that this light needs to be about seven or eight meters away from the subject. Now, unfortunately, I can't move it seven to eight meters further back that way. So what we're going to do instead is lift it up and we're going to make it so it's at the exact point where we get that look. Going to raise this up, it's probably going to be out of shot. There we go. So that my light's now about 14 foot up in the air now. Um, and I only know that because my ceilings are 14 foot high. So at this point, we're kind of set as to what we're going to get here. We're sort of We've gone through all the basics of getting a good exposure. Now, part of the reason I shoot in the way that I do is because we have clients on all the time. So we always have a client here who wants to see the images. So we use some software called Capture One, which I'm just gonna show you into now. There we go. Can you see the Capture One software? Super. So Capture One is my tethering software of choice. Let's reset my adjustments. There we go. And the reason I like Capture One is, well, there's multiple reasons for it. One is that during lockdown, it gave us the ability to have the clients signing off remotely. So they have a bit of extra software called Capture Pilot. So we get a couple of iPads out, we put people at different desks in the studio and they can all have the iPads and see what's going on. It also means that I can walk around with an iPad or my iPhone and fire it. More importantly than that for me though, if we take all like COVID restrictions out of the equation, is that Capture One doesn't keep crashing like Adobe Lightroom does. Um, so we've always had real problems with tethering to Adobe Lightroom where it just suddenly crashes out of nowhere. For no reason, the whole thing just comes to a grinding halt. Um, I'll show you my whole tether setup at the end, but for now, we'll just go with the, the capture one is good. Um, so we'll pop on our focus mask. 
and we can see that nothing there is currently in focus. There we go. Perfect. So we can now see with this like weird green sort of thing, it's in focus at the top and it's in focus at the bottom without having to focus that, which is very useful. So we need to change this up a little bit because it's a little bit too dark on this side for me, but the big benefit to hard light and tethering is this. You often, if you look at the back of your screen, it will look more like this because they always add contrast on camera screens. So with this here, you can actually go and have a quick look through and go, right, we've got the black point set all the way down. We can pull some shadow detail back in. Do we still need some more light on this side? Yes, probably we do. I'm not sure how well you can see this on a, on a live stream, but so we're just going to adjust the placement to the light ever so much. It comes a little bit more over the top. And I always think of these things as in what time of day it is. So if I'm going to have, and I got, I got this bottle opener in Lanzarote, I associate that with day drinking, um, which probably says more about me than it should. But because of that, I'm going to be thinking, well, the sun's high in the sky. It's coming down very strongly. We've got that nice midday sun. So we want the shadows to be short. We don't want long midday shadows. We want those short, crisp sort of shadows going on. So I'm going to keep bringing the light until it's more and more directly overhead, but still very high. So we're still getting that good even fall off across the frame. Command the cage fire, there we go. Super, so we're just gonna add a bit of clarity and punch to it. Have so slightly sharpen it. If you ever use the software, soft image sharpening number two is almost always the right setting, uh, which is always good to know. So we've got this nice, crisp, slightly dirty. You should always clean these things first. Um, bottle opener going on there so this is the the general gist of everything i said and it seems incredibly simple because it is um don't let everybody else know this or i'll be out of a job but the entire thing is pretty straightforward there's not really too much to it the difficulty comes with choosing the right subject choosing the right background choosing the right aesthetic and this is sort of where the the photography industry is moving at the moment it's less about can you do a 25 light setup and use a view camera? People are more interested in, can you create a bold and striking image that stops people when they're walking down the street because they're usually glued to their phones? So the, the kind of expectation as to what a photographer is has definitely changed a lot. Now, in terms of this whole setup here, the light I'm using is bizarrely enough not a Broncolor one because it's the only battery powered light I've got and I don't want to knock anything over. It's a Godox or Pixar Pro AD 1200, so it's a 1200 watt light. That's on full power. We're on F22 at 100 ISO over here. And then I've got a tether tools jerk stopper on the bottom. If you tether your camera, you'll see these jerk stoppers for sale. They're either like 30 pounds for a little dangly bit of fabric or 100 pounds for a, a small metal plate. Buy the expensive ones, not the cheap ones. And I'll tell you this from experience, because I saw the Tether Tools plate for £100 and went, not a chance. That's a rip-off. There's one for £25. Doesn't work. Same with the little cable protectors. They just don't work. The cost of having your USB port repaired in a Canon is £400. And when I didn't use to use them, we used to break them maybe twice a year per camera. Whereas now I think I break a Tether port maybe once every three years. So definitely a good investment. We've then got this beast of a cable. Now, the cable I'm shooting this on is Tether Tools, but this particular cable is a very special brand one where you need to know a guy with a phone number in a pub down in London and the cost of fortune, but they are obscenely good cables, but outlandishly expensive. Um, and that's all tethering into my Capture One system over here. And then I've got my BenQ monitor, which is this guy here. And this is more of a gaming monitor actually than anything else. And the reason I use a massive 4K huge gaming monitor in my tether setup is because we're never going to get good color readout in this room. We've got modeling lights, we've got LED lights on the ceiling, we've got all these different light sources coming in. There's no shades, I've got a wall of windows over here. So this monitor's primary objective is to be massive. So if I'm standing over here and I fire the camera, I can see the image from across the room without having to walk back and forth. That's what that one does. The actual color corrected ones are in my studio uh, editing suite. 
and there were like properly like blacked out walls behind it and all the rest of it so it's all perfectly set up for actual color workflow but when tethering the color workflow doesn't matter anywhere near as much because these are all raw files anyway we can pretty much do with what we want to them afterwards so we don't have to worry too much about that now the only extra bit of kit i often use and it's not a reflector it's actually the opposite and it's a flag and this is something where people often ask me if my shadows aren't dark enough what do i do and i grab one of these things here this is just like black fabric i got down the market i think or actually i think it's stage curtain uh, on a little frame and again you can grab those from wax and if you put it on the opposite side to the light it'll often just absorb any extra bounce in the room and just darken that shadow ever so slightly you can see there just in the shadow areas it's a little bit darker just by adding a bit of black fabric let me show that with you there we go so this is without the black fabric and this is with the black fabric so it's very small it's not like a huge huge change but sometimes that small subtle difference is all you need in order to get something completely new there we are still there so this is the baseline starting point for this obviously we can start to add more and more to it so i'm going to show you now is a slightly different approach which is perhaps more fashion related which might sound strange but you have to remember almost all fashion brands have a object which they sell which isn't clothing whether it's a wallet a, a bracelet or even like the apple watch or whatever it might be there's always something which as a food drink and still life photographer you might be asked to shoot now one of the big things about having spent years being a portrait photographer so I ended up with all these massive paper rolls back here and they're an absolute nightmare because you've got to store them when you get them down it takes two people but when you're working as a still life photographer for this sort of work you want to get yourself done hobbycraft I'm sure there's an American equivalent but hobbycraft sell these bits of like paper these are not photographic specific in any way whatsoever it's just a bit of card and it allows you to pretty much do whatever you need with this is pretty much all we use for our work so the next trend sort of thing in this world of photography is the straight on flash shot and it was very popular in the 90s with fashion photographers and they used to have the, their assistant stood there with a little uh, diner light just directly above and i'm going to show you the modern day equivalent of that hopefully so what i'm doing now is I'm going to lower my camera down there we go grab myself an extra light stand and this tends to be how I set up my shoots it's just a C stand um, these ones are newer ones just in case anyone's interested I tend to put a sandbag on it because I'll definitely lean on it at some point and break it Grab a couple of clamps like this and all we need to do is take our paper background and peg it on in the exact same way that you would with a big colorama sort of roll it's the same thing the same system it's just considerably smaller and easier to maneuver as an individual person i've had to do workshops in the past where i've been changing out backdrops by myself the big ones and it's just the most undignified thing you've ever seen so i've got my little bottle open again and the bottle open is just chosen because it happened to be the nearest thing to me and we're again going to go with a hard light but this time with the more fashion sort of lighting setup i'm going to bring my light around the front and then just boom it over
Now, one of the reasons I like these sort of like packs and head systems is because the heads are so tiny. So instead of using one of my massive sort of boom stands or cine stands, I can just use a C stand with a flimsy little arm and it will hold it perfectly in place. Now, if you're around in the 90s at all, you'll have had one of those point and shoot film cameras pointed at you and blitz with flash, and you get that horrific shadow on the background. And this tends to be why people shy away from hard light, and it's why flash companies sell you, you don't buy like your, your speed light flash, they sell you those diffusion bits that you put on the front and they say it softens the light, but obviously it doesn't, it just diffuses it. It's trying to get rid of that problem. So it's going to refocus my camera. There we go. Let's get you back at looking at Capture One. That's a bit hot at the moment because I'm too close in. There we go. So again, very hard light, completely out of focus uh, bottle opener. There we go. Perfect. And you can see how it's got that slightly different aesthetic to what you perhaps might be expecting from a still life image. We'll just open those shadows up a bit. We'll look at some of the problems we get from this sort of work. So if you've ever tried to photograph reflective metal before, you'll know that it's an absolute pain. And hard light makes it even worse. It gives you that, um... oh, how do I get the product? I'll answer that question in a sec. Um, you get these horrible like reflections on these sharp metal bits. And there is a, there's a trick for that. Normally what you'd do, you'd get a scrim, place a scrim over the light, and that diffusion would give you a nice even lighting going on. But better than a scrim, if you want hard light, and you don't want to have to soften it and diffuse it, is this stuff here. This is called K-Line Semi-Matte. And you spray this stuff on it, and it gives you a scrim just on the area you want. So instead of having reflective metal, you end up with a nice matte metal. Now, normally, you wouldn't do it on everything, but because I'm a bit cack-handed, I've just doused the bird. So this is the nasty reflections that you expect from hard light on a metal thing. And this is when it's got the K line on it. And can you just see the difference in how much nicer nasty reflections, K line reflections. And this stuff here is just one of those things that people sort of take for granted because it's not openly like talked about. They'll be like, oh yes, if we pop a scrim in here, we'll get a beautiful catch light in the metal. But when you want the hard light aesthetic and everything else, a bit of K-line works really well. And there's loads of these little tips and tricks that you pick up over the years. So because the lighting in itself is so simple and so straightforward, you have more time to focus on other things. When I used to shoot the more, oh, what's the best way to describe it? The old school style of work. We used to have like a huge softbox coming in for a window. We'd then have a scrim, we'd then have some spotlights and all that. And you spend so long messing around with all these lights that you couldn't focus on the details. You couldn't focus on those little things that make a real difference. And being able to really simplify things, and again, it's just a bare bulb light lighting this. There's nothing else. There's no reflectors. There's no extra bits and pieces. And you can suddenly go, right, well, if this is where we are so far, what if I want a little bit of extra light on the metal at the bottom? We've got time to think about that now. Okay. I've got a, a sheet of A4 printer paper. I'm going, okay. I want to see if we just pop this under here. Will this help us? Apart from my hand casting a shadow, it does. So we can just go, yes, we can just pop a bit of white paper down here just to bounce a bit of light back. And that's going to make all the difference in terms of creating and crafting that perfect image. We don't need to worry about all of these million and one things. 
And this is definitely the way that photography is going commercially speaking. Obviously, in the more hobbyist realm, if I was doing this as a hobby, I'd want to get 50 lights out and play with cool tech. Um, absolutely, hands down, no questions, that's what I'd want to do. But in terms of creating commercially viable work that sells for a good amount of money, it's all about this sort of aesthetic at the moment. Now, obviously, these are very slapdash examples of it compared to what I showed you earlier, but hopefully you can see that with just a bottle opener that cost a euro from some like shop on the beach, you could create an interesting image out of pretty much anything from within there. You don't have to have loads of kit. You don't have to have a, a really expensive item to photograph. You can just choose mundane things and make them into something interesting by crafting that hard light, getting the perfect lighting position, choosing the right angle of light, and then most importantly is choosing the right subject to be photographed. So I think they're all very easy things to overlook in the photography world. Uh, and I'm sure you're all as guilty as I am, especially when I was starting out. I don't really understand how I have all this kit in here because I don't need it, I don't use it, but I was fixated on getting the next best thing and the next useful thing and, and you know the next bit of kit, the next lens and all the rest of it. And I have spent a sum of money I wouldn't want to disclose on kit. And if you look at what I've got here, we've got a single light up here. Granted, this is not the cheapest camera in the world, but I think well, the body was three grand, the cambo was two grand, the lens was 500. It's not silly money. We're not talking phase one or Hasselblad money. It's, you know, it's, it's affordable camera kit because I don't need to have anything which captures anything perfectly because that's not my aesthetic. And this is very much the sort of setup, especially this one. I was going to lower the light so you can see exactly where, what it's doing. I'm going to bring it down from three meters from where it is. Is that coming in frame yet? There we go. This light is just quite simply bare bulb and it's coming straight down onto the set. This is how we lit the GoPuff ad campaign. Um, the whole thing was lit pretty much like this. Um, it was a little bit more fancy than that. We had some flags coming in and items. We had some great stylists, great retouches and all the rest of it. But this is the lighting setup we use. Same with some work we did for a brand I can't name at the moment, but you'll see it out soon. And it was all shot with this lighting setup. And as photographers, especially as men like myself, who are a bit nerdy, it's very easy to go, I should be doing more than this for this amount of money. I should be adding more. I should be creating something which no one else can technically do. But a lot of the time, the correct answer is to go, if this is enough, then this is enough. Don't add to it. Don't, don't go too far. Don't overdo it. Stick with something which actually works and looks good, and that will be the best way to achieve these interesting images. I think the same goes for soft light. You don't, you don't have to have a million and one like soft boxes set up and I used to build these massive softbox banks where we'd get like loads and loads of one by one meter soft boxes and stack them up into huge frames. So we'd got evenly spaced lights throughout it rather than one giant softbox. We thought that looked better. Then I went on a, a mission finding bronze color hazy lights, which are these big things here. These offer like this is the pinnacle of soft light. Nothing's ever been as good as this. Um, and they, they used to cost about 10 grand each, which is why. But I've not used this apart from for a background video prop for a very long time because this is what I go to. This is my go-to sort of look. Um, but yeah, this, this is basically the nuts and bolts of hard light photography. Now, as a bit of a shameless plug, I do have a, a workshop which is hours long on hard light where we go into some obscene detail about it. But from this information here, you can get most of it up and running. You can get going. You probably have the kit you need already. And I make it very, very clear as well. If you don't have a flashlight, but you have an LED, that doesn't matter. It does the exact same thing. The way the light will be put out will be the same. It's just not as powerful. So you can absolutely do it with the, the big lights. I mean, this is all being lit in here at the moment by Aperture uh, AD600 Pros. And one of those is as good as this Pixar Pro light in terms of the quality of image it can create. It's just not quite as powerful. So you might need to bump your eyes up to 200, but with modern cameras, it's not, not really a massive issue. How am I doing for time? I'm running a bit ahead of schedule. Does anyone have any questions at the moment before I uh, tilt? I'll just quickly answer this question before we go any further from Jeff about how I'm getting the product to stand and appear tilted or in, uh, in those shots. If you assume you mean these shots here, my items just fell down. I've currently got a uh, a light cap 
and the bottle opener and some blue tack, and this is a very high, high tech system where we just place it on this. When we want to get that super extreme angle coming up, we'll place it on something which is like a clear perspex and then just crop at the bottom just so we can see right underneath it. Um, but yeah, that, that's quite a, often getting the item to be held correctly is quite difficult. I own a load of science clamps. If you think back to your high school days, when you used to go into the lab and you had the little clamps that held the test tubes over the Bunsen burners, I bought all of that sort of stuff from like a school supply shop and we'll often use those just to hold, hold bottles in places and all the rest of it. And uh, John's question. Uh, fair enough, shooting a small object close to the background, but your Coke bottle, the top of the bottle is several inches away from the background. I don't understand how a hard shadow is cast from the top of the bottle. Um, it is all to do, ah, the Coke bottle one, the light was placed very far away. So we put a 3200 watt, I'm just trying to pull that Coke bottle shot up before we show you. Um, if we just get the screen open. Apologies, I'm on a new Mac at the moment, so I'm not particularly uh, savvy with it. And then I should be able to go to here. Keynote. Show, there we go. So this Coke bottle on the right here, in order to get the shadow, I assume you mean the gap, there's a gap between where the Coke ends and the bottle cap starts. Uh, and if you mean how did we get it pitch black in that bit there, we use the extremely advanced technical method of placing a bit of black card behind the Coke bottle for one frame and then taking it away for the next one and just brushing it out. That was the sort of the gist of the shot. So it was a, a composite of two frames and then we just we hid something behind it just to make sure that you got the solid shadow for the bit where there's no Coke between the top of the Coke and the bottle cap. Um, and then it's purely distance. So the smaller the light source, the crisper the distance. And if I have a light, when we've got a mounting place in the far corner of my um, studio up there, if we have it up there and we have something on the floor down here, it's about 20 foot away. So a 3200 watt head just produces extremely crisp shadows. Um, and obviously that's not always an option. You can't always put a light that far away in order to create a, a super crisp shadow. And the biggest downfall to hard lighting is there is no escaping the need of space. So it's not something you can easily do in your sitting room if your sitting room's not massive. Um, I know that I have some one-to-one -one clients over in the States and they're like, yeah, I can do it in my, in my kitchen. My kitchen's huge. It's about the size of a house in the UK. So you do need at least eight meters to stand a fighting chance. And as subjects get bigger, you need more space. And with that, you do start to need more power which is where things like the, the Bron Color score row packs come in, where you can sort of like daisy chain them together and make them ping pong and do all these weird, brilliant things and sort of set up massive banks of light miles away just to get enough sort of power coming in. Um, I'm just going to answer these questions whilst going along. How do I get craft paper looking so smooth and continuous? So there's two parts to this. Uh, well, there's three parts, actually. One is I'm going to bring my camera over to show you better. So when I'm using this particular camera, if I'm shooting something which is laid flat like this, I can angle the camera in such a way and then bend the lens forward like this in such a way that we end up with just the item in focus and the paper being completely out of focus. So it looks really smooth because it's actually out of focus, but your eyes aren't used to seeing that because normally you'd expect at least somewhere on the paper to be in focus. But by having additional movements in a camera, it lets you choose where your focus is and where it isn't more importantly. So doing that really allows you to smooth out the back of the paper. And the next point is, is your light placement. So if your light is really far away, the entire sheet of paper will be evenly illuminated. Um, and that really helps. So if we look at the slide we've got up at the moment, let me pull it up. That's a good example of the difference here. So the picture on the left, the light is closer. So you can see it's brighter in the top left than it is in the bottom right. 
and that's why the shadow is not as crisp from the hot dog. Whereas the Coca-Cola bottle on the right hand side, the light was shot from a very long way away. So the entire frame is completely evenly exposed without there being any fall off or gradation. That's purely just down to distance of light. And, and between those two bits there, that's kind of that's kind of how we get that really smooth paper look. Um, that and buying good quality paper. If you buy cheap paper, it never looks quite as good. Um, I'm assuming I'm all good to answer these questions now. Um, Sudhir, how do you get, I've answered them, I'm sorry Sudhir. From Paul, um, can you say where K-Line comes from and what it actually is? <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's extremely flammable and apparently kills fish. Um, I don't know what it is. You can buy it from most photography shops. There. It's like a photographer's brand. It's like for TV, motion pictures, and all of that sort of stuff. It's a proper... Most studios have K-Line um, that I go to, and this is their semi-matte dulling spray. Really expensive when you buy it, it seems, but, I mean, this can here will last me, like, I don't know, I've had it for at least six months. It's tied to my camera up so I don't have a bit of a disastrous tumble there. Uh, so John, due to budget small space lounges and using speed lights, do you feel that speed light with a diffuser on it can function in a similar way? Uh, no, so as soon as you put diffusion in front of your speed light, it's suddenly no longer a hard sort of metallic light source. If you put the diffuser on there, it's going to diffuse it. And if it's a diffuser in terms of a softbox or something bigger than the bulb itself, it will also soften it. But if you've got a speed light and you put it in the top right-hand corner of your living room and you shoot in the bottom left-hand corner, you can absolutely recreate this sort of work. You need it to be on full power and you probably have to bump your ISO up to 400 or 640. Um, but it's, yeah, it's pretty, pretty much just need as little as possible. You need to make your light as small as possible. And if you want those really crisp shadows then definitely don't put any diffusion in front of it because that will actually soften the shadow even though it's not softening the light. Um, but it's definitely worth just trying to keep those speed lights completely bare bulb. Uh, so Jennifer says, how do you get even lighting when you don't have a powerful light source? What if you use a 600 watt strobe? So that's a very good question. If you have a 600 watt strobe, you can get even lighting still because um, you can still light something from six to eight meters away. The problem you're going to have is that you won't be able to get as much of a depth of field at base ISO. So if you assume that shot I've just taken was at F22, 100 ISO, and the light was at 1200 watts. So if we half that, that's 600 watts. So if we half this, we'll go down to like F11. So I won't be able to get F22, but F11 would be acceptable. Is my maths right? I think it's right. So yeah, you can still do it with a 600 watt light. Um, when I started out, I had those Bowens 500 watt heads. I've still got them actually. They're on a trolley down there as emergency lights. I've got like five of them left, so blew the rest. Um, they're only 500 watts. You can still do it with that. You just can't get the extreme apertures. Um, or the extreme like modification of light. So although often we shoot bare bulb, we'll often have a million and one things placed in front of it at various distances just to create certain effects or flagging it or whatever it may be. Um, but 600 watts is, I, I think that's enough. I think 200 watts is probably pushing it and like a speed light is probably pushing it, but 600 watts will be more than enough to get this sort of look um, with your hard light images. Uh, Nick, how do you get the white Coca-Cola name to be so contrasty with this? Um, is it all masking and editing? No, I don't actually think it is all masking and editing. I think, what I remember, let me find the thing I use because these are a thing of beauty. The answer costs about one pound. Oh no, no, it's two times. At one pound, but it's a mirror. So you get your hard light and you just bounce it back in with one of these mirrors. And the thing about these is you have to buy loads of them in different shapes and sizes and all the rest of it because they all reflect slightly differently. So you need to find the one which has the, the right reflection for the shot you're doing. So for this Coca-Cola shot, it's obviously really easy to bounce light back into it, but we don't want it to go all over the bottle and cause chaos. So we'll get one of these here. We'll often put bits of black card over the front of it to flag it off. And we'll use this as a modifier just to bounce that little bit of light back in. And mirrors are really good when you're using hard light because it kind of matches that light source. If you use a bit of white card, you kind of end up with like a diffused soft light coming back in again. Um, whereas these here are much more in keeping with the, the hard light sort of setups. 
Uh, question from John, what tripod head do you use? So although I have a lot of tech, I'm not very tech savvy. It's a Cambo Actus. And it's a bull head. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. It doesn't, it just, it's by Cambo. Um, and it's kind of like a bull thing, like this. You can really easily freehand move it and then just lock it off in place. Um, I didn't choose it. It's not my first choice, it just came with the camera. Um, I prefer geared heads, but this whole camera has to sit on one of these tripods, so it has to be able to, the whole thing comes off like this. Just unplug my battery. So the rails are here and these rails slide into this part here. So it wouldn't work on my geared heads, but normally I'd use a Manfrotto geared head or an Arca Swiss one if we're renting them for big productions, because they are beautiful. But there's some ridiculous amount of money. It's like an Arca Swiss Cube or something like that. They're like the, the gold standard of tripod heads. They're beautiful to use. But yeah, generally just like a Manfrotto geared head, unless I'm using this beast. Question from Adrian. What size is the flash bulb? I use an old Bowens with the circular bulb and always provides less than sharp shadows. Um, all flash tubes are kind of the same size-ish. When you get the 32 or 6400 watt heads, they tend to be double spirals, but they don't really tend to differ much, maybe a millimeter or so. If you're not getting the crisp shadows, your light's too close is, is the very short of it. If your shadows aren't crisp enough, your light's too close, or your subject is bouncing light back between the paper and itself. So if we just go back quickly to this uh, keynote thing, and if you look at the, the hot dog here, you'll notice a slightly brighter area in the shadows. And that is where the white of the bread has actually bounced back some of the, can we see that? I don't know, I might have it paused. There we go. That's showing now. The white of the bread's actually bouncing back some of that light. And this is when you'd bring a black flag in just to absorb any light bouncing around. Um, but generally speaking, the size of your flash tube, it, it shouldn't be an, off, an issue. There shouldn't be a problem with how big the flash tube is because they're, they're pretty much the same size. Um, so yeah, wouldn't worry too much about that. But definitely move it further away. The further away it is, the better it'll be. Question from Franco. Will using Fills light. So I've not my glasses on. Let me try and give myself a fighting chance here. Well, using fill light, the mirrors ruin my dark shadows. How can we avoid that? Ah, yeah. So if you use a fill light, you'll ruin your shadows. Um, but if you use a mirror, obviously, if you had it like this and say this this thing heals your subject, that would ruin the shadow if the shadow is being cast in front of it. But as you start to angle it up, it no longer hits the shadow on the ground. So if you're not interfering with the shadow directly, it's all good, which is why you need so many different size mirrors. Don't buy expensive ones. Go to like Poundland and places like that and just give them a go. And using those, you can just like sort of angle it so we can just highlight what we need and nothing else. And James says, do you think an AD200 would work adequately? Absolutely. Let me show you an image I shot with an AD200. Uh, So both of these were shot with an AD200, which I think is the, there's a Pixar Pro Pika 200, isn't there? Um, I think, I think it's the same one. It's like a tiny little battery powered thing. I got given one, I've since passed it on. Um, but they were shot with it because it freezes action really well. Um, as was, and maybe I don't have anything else in here which was shot with one. But yes, you can do it with that. Obviously it's not as good because you don't have the same same amount of hard lights power as, as it were once it's 10 meters away you're getting like f 2.8 up close so it's always better to have more so you don't have to bump the iso but it's not the end of the world um a question from ryan would a medium format not give you better resolution than 35 millimeter format camera for big clients you work for um maybe not really resolution um there's kind of a limit to how much resolution you need. So this is a 50 megapixel camera. We sometimes use the phase 100, um, but the problem with that is by the time using medium format for the style of work I do, I want everything in focus and you're gonna have to focus stack a lot. Um, and there's also, there's other benefits and I won't go too far into this in this particular video because it'll be boring as sin for a lot of you. But when you start doing this to your camera, you start changing which part of the image circle you're using. 
and then you start bending your lens that way and then moving it also up this way and all of a sudden you're getting like some weird obscure corner of the of the lens projecting onto this so if this was a bigger sensor we'd start getting vignetting we'd get fall off of focus fall off of light around the edge of the camera whereas with a very small sensor a 35 millimeter sensor and a very large image circle from the lens it means I can do extreme movements without any issues with corner to corner sharpness, which is more important. The benefit that a medium format sensor would give me would be that I'd have a greater bit depth of color, um, which I do like. And sometimes if we're shooting something which is like red on red on red, we'll shoot it on a phase one. Um, but to replace my current kit with a phase one kit, I looked into it, it was about 60,000 pounds. And to be honest, I'm not gonna spend 60 grand <laughs> is, is the short of it. Um, so this is going to be my last question. Which lens do you use for extreme close-ups? Any lens. So the reason I'll, I'll explain it in two ways. Extreme, well, <laughs> many lenses. This camera here can focus as close as the glass at the front of the lens on any lens I put on it because it's a bellows system. So everything on here can shoot macro, but they're not necessarily macro lenses and macro lenses. The elements are put together in a particular way. If I'm doing standard work, I use my macro planar. This is not a full one-to-one -one focus for macro, but it's pretty close and the, the coatings on the lens are beautiful, so you get really good highlight rendering, um, which again sounds boring and nerdy, but it's, it's a good bit of kit. And then for the super close shots, which are like, let me just see if I can uh, quickly show you one before I dash off. I'll show you what we did, uh, did today. Yeah, we're going to share this with you. So this here is the insides of a deep fat fryer with some calamari being dunked into it. Um, and this is extremely close up, like millimeters away. And for that, we use this, which is the probe lens. And I don't own this because once you've done that shot, you've kind of done it. So we just rent this one in and it's actually going back tomorrow. But this probe lens here is really cool. Um, so we've been using that, which is why it smells of calamari and beer in here at the moment. Um, but there we go. Yes, super. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a, a very brief understanding of hard light with the simple basic facts being don't use a modifier, put the light as far away as possible and focus on choosing a good subject, good background and getting creative angles. Uh, and with that, you can really cool, you know, if you just think this is quite literally just some calamari I've cooked in the oven then dunked into a fish tank full of some water with a bit of food coloring on it. You can do some really cool things with that. Um, but there we go. Is that is that all good, Alexandra? I uh, still can't see people, so it's a bit strange. Yes, lovely. Well, thank you very much for all stopping by. I believe a recording of this is going out tomorrow at a similar sort of time. Um, and we'll ping you all the links to everything. So yeah, thank you. Thank you all for coming around. It's a Greatly appreciated, and um, thank you for giving me your time. Oh, do I have any up and coming workshops? I do, what a, what a good plug. Um, I have a workshop coming up at the end of this month, and they're all they're done online, it's a weird way I do things. Um, but we sell the first 100 tickets for 60 pounds, and then if there's a fault in it, I don't feel guilty for editing it badly, and then we fix it and send you the proper version out. And the next one is Drinks Photography 101. Um, which is kind of going to be a deep dive into drink photography from the point of view of a working commercial photographer. Obviously, there's loads of drink photography workshops out there, but this will be much more focused on this is what people actually want at the moment in the commercial world rather than here's 10 ways to light a drink. Um, but yes, and then apart from that, I have a YouTube channel as well called Tin House Studio, which is the studio we're in here. Um, where I sort of make weekly videos about the, the commercial side of photography and the business side of it. It's a nice small little group of us. Um, and yeah, it's all, all quite friendly and chummy. There we go. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And I'll um, hopefully see some of you all soon.